Welcome to the Share Chair Podcast, where we tell each other stories and learn from listening. Well, for me, it really starts with your own um, journey. You work for Quartz, um, which is an online magazine, right? And um, well, I don't know. Could you just talk about your professional career to start us off a little bit? It's very long. <laughs> um, yeah. I've been writing for over 20 years. Um, I started in um, as a reporter in Mexico City for an English language publication that nobody's ever heard of. Went to grad school because I didn't understand the economics that I was writing about in Mexico during the devaluation. Um, and then got a job at a finance magazine in New York called Institutional Investor and really sort of built up an expertise in finance. And I spent 10 years at the New York Times. And first I covered finance for about seven of them. And then I had a couple kids and I was getting really interested in education. And I found out I was just reading about it all the time. So they me into the education world. I covered that for three years. And then in London, I was finance and I really missed the education stuff and courts approached me with the ability to create my own obsession and that obsession I created was the science of learning and another one around the art of parenting and sort of this intersection of a lot more we know about education and science and what we're trying to accomplish but how do we do it and it's all messy and how do I do it without being hysterical basically which a lot of places are. So um, most most recently, I mean, the reason that I reached out to you is because of this, um, because of empathy, and you noticed something happening in Denmark. I guess there's a <laughs> another famous line there, but something <laughs> happening in Denmark. But uh, but could you describe <laughs> what you discovered there? What what's going on with empathy and Denmark? Yeah, so I, um, I saw a piece that was written by a woman who wrote a book about um, parenting in Denmark. Um, and it was, a, it was a piece about um, how Danish schools taught empathy. And I thought, that's amazing, because by teaching it and embedding it in the curriculum, you were making it very clear that that's something you value, right? You, um, you're putting it there. You're setting aside the time. You're giving teachers the resources. They've even given it a format, book a cake, a, a particular kind of cake every week. So that they're really kind of invested in this um, idea of taking time to learn these skills. How do you learn to be, you know, hopefully some of us are born empathetic, but even if you aren't, how do you build those skills? And I just love the idea that in the same way that you would spend hours on a field practicing your soccer or you would spend hours, you know, honing your by no means, you would also practice empathy. You would practice listening to others and, and sort of, um, it's almost, I think a little bit, again, I'm older, but like, it's like marriage counseling for teenagers, right? How do you actually properly listen to each other? How do you put your defenses down and hear each other? And what, what how do you design a classroom and a space to do that? And they've, and they've done that and I just loved it. And I got super excited about it. So I called the author and I interviewed her and she told me about it. Yeah, that's great. And so what were some of the ways you discovered them practicing that? So they have, starting from kinder, basically kindergarten, there is an hour set aside every single week. Class in time. Class in tide. I'm sure I'm botching the um, language here. Um, my Danish is not particularly good, but it's an hour that's set aside, mandated by law. Um, and... Uh, uh, kids sit in a circle and they bake this cake and it, the idea is it's very open format. There's no structure to it, but it's to talk about a problem anyone in the class is feeling. So one of the things that um, it is bound to teach you is the courage to say you're having a problem, right? I mean, that in and of itself is very challenging. You're doing it in a space where people have to listen to you. You know, there, there's the teacher's going to be aware of the importance of people's body language and, and how they talk. And so everybody gets to be heard, and to be heard is like a pretty human thing, right? To, if you really know you're being heard properly, it allows you to do a lot of things, to take risks academically, to feel safe socially. I just, I think that's going to enable so many other things. And so I, I was encouraged by that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, and that's... That's what we're trying to practice here. I mean, we're trying to practice it more than pr- 
preach it with this uh, movement is let's just get our stories out there and get them in a safe space. Um, and because then, because it just opens up community, and we know that when a community is stronger, then people can move better through that into um, success. So, but even our movement is only extracurricular; it's not embedded in the uh, curriculum like in Denmark. So, um, some people would argue that that's for the parents to worry about. That's for something to happen at home, you know, elevating empathy and teaching empathy. What is your view? You know, obviously you think that it should be embedded in the curriculum, but why? Um, because I think we have a lot of research now that shows us that, you know, the sum of a person's success in life, if we're defining success by employment and satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment, getting a 1600 on your SAT, right? That is a piece of it, <laughs> but it is not yeah. everything. There are many skills um, that we need and I think schools and parents should be very aware that along with these sort of academic skills we're building there are all of these other critically important skills which I think you could call character, you could call mm -hmm. values without the sort of weird religious overtones, you can call it something but kids need those to succeed. They need to know how to be resilient, they need to know how to um, you know push through a tough task and they really need to know how to here are others. The world is very global, and it's a, a critical life skill to be able to listen, to hear someone different than you, um, to hear them, and, and to sort of think about how you respond, to be sensitive to that response. So I just think it's a critical life skill, and so, you know, I don't know if U.S. schools can embed it in their curriculum, but if enterprising teachers can find a way to teach it, that's amazing. <laughs> so hats off to you guys. Well, so, th so that was, so that's one of the questions is like, so uh, action steps. I mean, um, as you process it as a journalist um, and as a parent and uh, through all of your different um, identities, how, how, do, how can we, what are some ways that we can do that? So I love, uh, I, I'm not going to remember it, and I'll remember a few pieces of it, but um, one of the links in my story was Michelle Borba, who wrote a book about Empathy has this um, list of nine characteristics of empathetic people, and she sort of derived this from interviews with 60 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And very great, it's a great way of framing that there are these nine skills. And one of the most basic ones, and this is one I think about as a parent a lot, is modeling, right? Are you kind to others? Do you listen to others? Do you stop on the street to help somebody? Who needs help, even if you're in a rush, you know, these actions add up. And so I guess modeling is probably the most critical one as a parent we can use. Um, I think as a teacher, as with being a parent, there is um, positive reinforcement. When you see it happen, celebrate, right? That was amazing the way um, Jamil helped uh, Jane with her homework. She was really struggling. He didn't judge her for not um, knowing how to do something that other kids in the class knew how to do, but he helped her. What a great thing. Thanks a lot for doing that. I think those little things, and if you can have an hour every week in the classroom, fantastic. I recognize that that might not be realistic, um, but, you know, I do think modeling, I think um, calling it out when you see it, I don't, I don't know, maybe making ambassadors or empathy ambassadors of sorts, sort of teaching getting a couple people to maybe read Borba's work and then bring it to the class and do a presentation. Maybe yeah. finding, doing a unit on um, help solve a global problem. I don't know, did empathy end slavery? Did empathy end, uh, you know, the Cold War? I, I doubt it did, but <laughs> it's an interesting question. <laughs> and it's not maybe a traditional way of posing it. What role did empathy play in X? Could we find anything that said, you know, when Abraham Lincoln saw the lives of X. I don't know, I'm just sort of riffing off the top of my head that these are ways that I'm thinking of. You know, when you start working on this and we, we start putting episodes out or we start sharing podcasts, I, I've run into a few people who say, well, your efforts are, I mean, minimal. I, there's still going to be cruelty. There's still going to be, you know, how, when you're responding to that kind of, well, one, I'm kind of curious if you even run into that but if you do how do you re respond or react to that 
I would say something is better than anything in any realm. I mean, honestly, if you want to look at the political landscape today in America and look at Donald Trump and look at Hillary Clinton, I think you could argue that empathy is something seriously true or are. Um, and so what is yeah. it going to take for us to actually be able to hear each other? I don't know. Is it more math? Probably not. Is it more science? Unlikely. <laughs> is it <laughs> Jane Austen, it's definitely not. It is empathy, right? It is the ability to recognize attracted to Trump for a reason, right? And we should be understanding that reason and not just condemning him for being a bigot and a misogynist. Well, be, but why? Why are people like think about to be unemployed or have your wages be stagnant for 20 years? Maybe why Donald Trump's message would appeal to you in that instance. You know, I just feel like it's so lacking. So to anyone who says like this might not make a difference, no oh, shit. I mean, a lot of things might not make a difference, but it's damn well worth trying. That's right. Worth trying. That's right. Amen.